a thousand milligrams is uh, effective dose, or ED100, effective dose of 100% of the population. If you take 4,000 milligrams of um, Tylenol at one time, which would be an acute effect, 50% of the population would die. So if you did take 8,000 milligrams, twice as much, 100% of the population would die. So you don't need to know the specific numbers, obviously, but just know that every toxin has an ED50, which is effective dose 50. It affects it affects 50% of the population every, um, and there can be an ED75, there can be an EB25, so that would be 25% of the population. 75 would be 75% of the population. There can be an LD50, which is lethal dose of 50%. There can be an LD75, lethal dose for 75% of the population. LD25, lethal dose for 25% of the population. The 25s would be down here, your 75s would be up here. But your ED50 and LD50 of no matter what it is should be similar. But the lethal dose is always going to be higher. So this is your margin of safety. That just means that if you take it anywhere in here, you should be fine. But and you won't die. That's what it means. Um, but your LD50 curve, which is this one here, is always going to be higher than your ED50 curve. Because obviously effective dose is going to be less than your lethal dose. That makes sense, right? Okay. So pesticides and fertilizers also have ED50 and LD50. And it doesn't just have to be for people. It can be for plants. It can be for mosquitoes. It can be for any kind of organism. So they could ask you a, a AP essay question on that. You know, interpret the graph. What's the LD50 of some sort of pesticide? What's the ED50 of some sort of pesticide? You know, and discuss ways that you would reduce that amount of pesticide or alternatives of that pesticide in the environment. So who can think of like an alternative to a chemical pesticide? This is one of those BS questions. Somebody tell me. What's, a, what's an alternative to a chemical pesticide? Say DDT. What's an alternative to DDT? Yeah, organic pesticide. What's something else? Anything. You can pretty much BS this. Anything. Go ahead. Yeah, you could genetic engineer the plants to prevent, or the animals to prevent the mosquitoes from, you know, affecting them. Something different. Exactly. <laughs> you could throw in an invasive species. It could eat whatever the thing is. And it's going to affect, you know, you're not going to have as many, you know, those organisms. So, yeah, you can make it up. I mean, it's got to be relative. Realize that bears aren't really going to eat mosquitoes. But you could even say just I would throw in or I would, in, I would introduce an invasive species or a different species into the environment that eats the whatever's bothering things, the rabbits, the mosquitoes, the whatever it is. So yeah, that's the right way to think. All right, disease. The difference between infection and disease. Infection is when a pathogen invades your body. So it can be a bacteria or a virus, sometimes a fungus. Athlete's foot is a fungus. Um, a disease is when an infection changes the state of your health. So you may have a cold, which is an infection. But if you have a cold that doesn't keeps on going for the majority of the time, then it's some kind of disease. If you can't really get rid of it. And they used to think, back in the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century, so the early 1900s, they used to think that tuberculosis was a cold at first. Because you coughed, you cough up phlegm. You know, they thought it was some kind of bronchial inf infection. And then it would never heal. It wouldn't get better. It would just get worse and worse or just prolong for decades. And that would be considered a disease. And they didn't identify it at that time, but then it turned out to be tuberculosis. So an example is the HIV is an infection caused by a virus. When one gets sick by the virus, she or he, has AIDS, which is a disease. So HIV would be the infection caused by the virus, and AIDS would be the disease that's caused by the virus. Okay.
air pollution. Switching gears a little bit. There's two sources. Just like there's two sources of global warming. There's natural and there's created by humans. It's kind of a trend that you'll see in environmental science. Everything's either everything has two sources. It's either natural or it's created by humans. So just that's just a general statement for almost everything. So so naturally released from the environment, an example would be carbon dioxide. Um, were created by humans, carbon would come out or be released by combustion of pretty much anything. Wood, fossil fuels, stuff like that. So some natural air pollutants would be pollen, dust, mold, ash, gases like carbon dioxide, dinoflagellates, which cause a red tide. So on the west side of the coast, in I think it's either late spring or early summer, they get, they yearly, almost yearly, annually get uh, a bunch of, the water turns red because it's got these dinoflagellates which cause red tide and so people can't go swimming in it because it, you know, can give them an infection. Um, Man-made, man-made pollution, air pollutants, um, increase greatly with the Industrial Revolution. So the mid-1800s when they started using a lot of coal, um, to run factories and, you know, they also use coal to heat people's houses, but that wasn't a major source. A major source would be running factories and things like that. Coal would be um, leading to, from the Industrial Revolution. So. Okay. All right, primary and secondary air pollutants. Primary air pollutants are re released directly into the lower atmosphere, which is called what? What's lower atmosphere? Yeah, troposphere. Androtoxic. Carbon, this is carbon monoxide. It's not a typo. Carbon dioxide isn't toxic unless we're filled with a room of carbon dioxide and there's no oxygen. But carbon monoxide, which comes out of um, the tailpipes of cars, is um, toxic. And if you're in an enclosed space like a, like a garage or something and running a car, Without any ventilation, you can get carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, but they're just air pollutants that affect that are in the lower atmosphere and are toxic by themselves. You don't need anything else to interact with them. Secondary air pollutants are formed by the combination of primary air pollutants with other primary air pollutants or natural substances in the environment. So acid rain is produced by a combination of sulfur oxides with water vapor. So a lot of times when things are combined with oxygen or when things are combined with water, they will make a secondary air pollutant. And that's what, and write this off to the side, that's what um, gray smog and brown smog are. They're secondary air pollutants. And also, write this off to the side, gray smog comes from basically the Industrial Revolution. Brown smog comes from car exhaust and is mixed with sunlight or UV rays. So gray and brown smog, which are the two types of smog, are secondary air pollutants. Gray smog is from places that burn coal usually or fossil fuels, but mostly coal. And it re reacts with, and we'll talk about this in a second, it reacts with water and different things in the environment, and it's gray. And then brown smog is um, stuff that comes out of your car, exhaust, and it's combined with ultraviolet radiation, and it makes it brown and hazy. So if you think of Los Angeles, Los Angeles had a lot of brown smog. All right. This is an important point. Um, point and non-point source pollution. So point source pollution is non-moving sources of pollution. So example would be a coal burning power plant. So it's easier to classify non-point source pollution. So non-source point, non-point source pollution are 
moving sources of pollution. So examples would be automobiles, anything that moves from one place to another and pollutes the atmosphere or water um, is considered a non-point source pollutant. Point source pollutants are factories, industry, and power plants, stuff like that. So here's an AP hint. Just remember this. Non-point source pollutions, pollutants are a bigger problem and cause more pollution than point source. So these are worse than these. They just are. And one of the main reasons is a lot of the, um, what do you call it, a lot of the laws address point source pollutants. So they say, okay, if you're going to build a power plant, you have to have scrubbers, you have to have this and that, and only use a certain amount of fuel. And if you're going to dump stuff in the water, it's got to be cooled, it's got to be processed. So a lot of laws deal with point source pollution and not so much non-point source. There are laws that deal with you know, automobile exhaust and stuff like that, but there's more laws that deal with point source pollutants than non-point source. So Always, if they ask you, non-point source pollutants are a bigger problem and cause more pollution than point source. So these are worse for the environment than these. Dirty half dozen. This you have to memorize. This is really important. It's the Environmental Protection Agency calls the following. They're called criteria in pollutants. And these are the most harmful types of pollutants. Make sure you write off to the side air pollutants because we're talking about air pollutants. So these are the primary bad, worst for you in the environment, air pollutants. And that's carbon monoxide, not carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, lead, ozone, O3, when it's in the troposphere, so when it's down here, just write that off to the side too. Write a little arrow and say when in troposphere or when near the ground, because it's supposed to be up high in the sky in the stratosphere. But if ozone is down here, it's a, considered a very bad pollutant. Nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and particulates. Particulates are basically dust, little particles floating around the air, so ash like that. Mm -hmm. Gasoline. Um, there's not much lead in gas anymore, but it used to give your car better gas mileage. It prevent older cars from knocking. It let the engine last longer. Um, pipes used to be made out of lead because lead's malleable. It bends easily and it doesn't rust. It, don't, it does flake off in little pieces into the water though, um, but, it, so, but it doesn't rust. So lead was like considered like a perfect thing to make pipes out of because you can bend it without heating it up too much and you know and it doesn't rust so it sounds like a great thing for pipes. And actually, and it used to also be in lead paint, and actually a lot of Europe and parts of the Americas, but a lot of Europe still have lead pipes, especially if you go to like Rome. And in Rome, almost every street corner, there's a constant ongoing fountain near the ground, like a little pipe out of the wall, 